Um, so we have now the chance to uh, have uh, Dr. Luca Mavelli from the University of Kent, uh, who will um, present his paper on the um, refugees. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much to, to Jeff. Thank you very much to Doc uh, for uh, making this possible. So the title is different, and I also thought I should deliver this presentation differently. So I hope it makes sense by the time we are at the end of it. But then the new title is The Neoliberal Political Economy of Civilization. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the argument that I would like to present is a very simple one. The way we think about the notion of civilization, particularly when it comes to Huntington, is very much linked to notion of culture and, uh, culture and religion. What defines a civilization is culture. What defines civilization is religion. Then there are more social theory, sociological approaches to civilization that think of civilizations in terms of social system. Um, I would like to put forward a different thesis, and my argument is that existing understandings of civilization and civilized life which I think are connected, are increasingly the product of a neoliberal political economy of life. So civilizers are those individuals and populations who are perceived to be endowed with valuable forms of capital, whether economic, financial, human, or cultural, which may contribute to advance the wealth and well-being of the country. So what is reshaping civilization, I want to argue, is not primarily similarity in terms of culture or religion or uh, um, social manners, but primarily in terms of the perceived value uh, of the people and the contribution they can give to uh, the country. Now, this uh, process, I think, is a product of what I describe as the growing sacralization of the market, so namely the establishment of the market as the overarching framework that governs all spheres of human activity. Um, so, in order to illustrate my argument, let me start with the uh, the refugee crisis. The refugee crisis, I'm sure you're all familiar with, just to give you a few, a few numbers to put things in context, there have been over a million people who in 2015 uh, attempted uh, to cross the Mediterranean. Uh, this number went down in 2016, uh, but then was up again in 2017, different routes, a number of the people who have tried to cross the Mediterranean die on a regular basis. I mean, there are basically 20,000 people who have died over the last 15 years in uh, crossing the Mediterranean. The peak was in 2015 when uh, 5,000 people died. And I mean, there's general agreement that these are preventable deaths, but at the same time, not much is being uh, done for that. Now, if you do a cursory search about how the migrants coming to Europe have been described, you will find the terms like a swarm, a flood, a flow, a rising tide, an invasion, a tidal wave, and a stream of migrants inundating Europe that threatens its economical, social, cultural, and religious foundation. So you have lots of metaphors concerning water. Uh, Europe is being submerged by uh, the others. So what are, who are these others? The others are the uncivilized, the barbarians who are pressing uh, the borders. So this has resulted in a process of securitization of migration. Uh, a few examples, the proliferation of borders. Hungary is an example in this regard, with this razor wire barrier built with the border of Serbia, or the four kilometer long fence erected by Austria as the Slovenian border. There is the externalization of borders. Uh, there are hot spots, which are basically concentration camps that have been built in Libya with French and Italian uh, money. And there's more discussion that you know, more hot spots should be built in order to prevent uh, uh, you know, people from arriving. There have been the establishment of a number of immigration centers all across Europe. Um, and also the outsourcing of the refugee uh, humanitarian crisis uh, to Turkey. Um, now, one of the main catalysts for these increasingly harsh immigration policies is the uh, growing exclusionary civilizational discourse that basically sees the refugees primarily as Muslims. It's not just that we have the tide of people coming in, but the majority of those who are coming in are Muslims. So Alexander Betts, who's um, uh, an expert of uh, migration at the University of Cambridge, he, in 2006 he wrote a short article saying, you know, when we talk about the European refugee crisis, we should talk about Islam, and we don't do that enough. 
Islam is the elephant in the room, is our is, uh, words. Um, Kenneth Roth, the executive director of Human Rights Watch, has argued that the right-wing opposition to accepting refugees is ultimately not about employment, social welfare, welfare or management. He says, and I quote, what is really about is that they are Muslim. And therefore, they are the embodiment of a different and threatening uh, civilizations. And there are some states, most notably Eastern European states, that have been quite explicit about that, saying that you know, we will only take um, Christian refugees. Now, this question, this overlapping issue of otherness of uh, refugees being also Muslims, it's not a new thing. I mean, it has actually been observed quite a long time ago. In 2006, uh, sociologist Jose Casanova wrote, in Europe, immigration and Islam are almost synonymous. The overwhelming majority of immigrants in most European countries are Muslim, and the overwhelming majority of Western European Muslims are immigrants. This entails a superimposition of different dimensions of otherness that exacerbates issues of boundaries, accommodation, and incorporation. The immigrant, the religious, the racial, and the socioeconomic disprivileged other all tend to uh, coincide. Um, so I, I agree with this argument, and I think you know this explains a lot about uh, our understanding of civilization and civilizational anxiety. But the question I want to raise is that is, if, is there something more uh, to this uh, anxiety, but not so much to the anxiety, but primarily to the logics of inclusion and exclusions that uh, then European countries put um, in place. And in order to try to think differently in terms of economic logic based on logics of capital that value uh, the migrant or refugee according to their, their value, uh, I would like you to consider a brief case, which is the proliferation of citizenship by investment schemes in Europe. So in October 2013, Malta amended its Citizenship Act to include the possibility of purchasing Maltese citizenship for a 650,000 euro fee. Now, there was a big debate uh, there, big controversy, lots of opposition from other European countries, but also from the EU. The argument was this completely undermines the idea that uh, there should be a link, a connection, you know, if everyone can purchase citizenship. So Malta said, yeah, you're quite right. So what they did, they raised the fee. So it's slightly more expensive. You need to have over a million. Uh, uh, euro to buy it. Still, it's cheaper than Cyprus because you need 5 million euro in Cyprus. But if you lost money in the financial crisis, you can have a discount for that. <laughs> so, you know, there's a way to get around that. As of November 2016, Malta had sold 477 passports. In the same period, 2013-2016, uh, it granted refugee status to 600 non-EU citizens, whereas more than 12,000 undocumented migrants died in the attempt to cross the Mediterranean. Now, these citizenship by investment schemes have been established in Malta, Cyprus, Bulgaria, Romania, but there are also other countries like the UK, Portugal, Spain, that have introduced different measures. They're not quite citizenship by investment schemes, but they are uh, schemes that allow you, if you invest money in the economy, if you purchase bonds, uh, basically to gain permanent residency, and they basically fast track you uh, to uh, citizenship. I see a tension here. What is the tension? On one hand, several European states have been selling citizenship to wealthy migrants, a significant proportion of which is represented by oil wealthy Muslims from the Gulf states. <coughs> Uh, these are the good Muslims, if you want to use Mahmoud Mahdani's famous category, or in the framework of the argument that I'm presenting, these are the civilized, the wealthy, civilized Muslims. On the other, European states have been deploying a strategy of containment and securitization, targeting undocumented migrants. These are the bad Muslims, the uncivilized, the barbarians who try, uh, threaten to submerge Europe. So we have. Uh, a tension here. We have on the one hand the opening of global mobility corridors for the ultra-rich, and on the other we have the hardening of borders for refugees and documented migrants, and even economic viable migrants. Now they illustrate how the selective openness and closure of borders is becoming a function of the human economic or financial capital of the migrants. 
So my argument is that the possibility of civilizational belonging is increasingly becoming a function of the sacralized logic of uh, the neoliberal market. So what is this sacralized logic of the neoliberal market? What is this sacralization of uh, the market? This is a uh, very early stage. But I came to this concept, first of all, moving by very simple observation. I was doing work on the, European, uh, on the financial crisis. 2008 financial crisis. And I was reading, uh, uh, you know, serious economists. I was reading Stieglitz, I was uh, reading Piketty, I was reading historic like Hobsbawm. And at some point in their analysis, they all come up with uh, uh, references to neoliberalism as a sort of religion. Uh, Stieglitz writing in 2009, just after the crisis. He says, from a historical point of view, for a, quarter of, of, uh, for a quarter of century, the prevailing religion of the West has been market fundamentalism. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm, the famous historian, shortly after the crisis says, you know, we have, uh, of the last 25 years, have been dominated by a sort of theological free market ideology. Uh, David Graeber and Charles Piketty they spoke about neoliberalism as a kind of faith or as a theology disguised as social science. So my question was, what can we make about these comments? Is there a way of thinking of neoliberalism and the market as a sacralized system? You know, after all, the story that Weber <clears throat> tells us about secularization, about the process of disenchantment, is a process whereby the current economic order is the product of Protestantism. But that kind of system and logic that sustained Protestantism disappears, and what we are left with is bureaucratic rationality. That is the theory of secularization that we have. And therefore, we have a space characterized by separation into value spheres. Our life are, is characterized by the sphere of politics, the sphere of law, the sphere of medicine. Religion, be become, religion becomes a category uh, or a sphere among other spheres. And bureaucratic rationality is somehow the overarching framework. Um, a different understanding of secularization, and I think in this case, kind of more relevant uh, to understand this discourse of neoliberalism as religion, is provided by uh, George Ragamben uh, in one of his, his latest book, The Kingdom and the Glory. There, Ragamben talks about uh, secularization uh, not as a stage, but as a signature. And basically, his argument is that secularization is a, state, is a process which has led to a state, which is, secular, which is an epistemic framework that continuously evokes religious meanings and, and signification, thus prompting a continuous process of blurring, displacement, and renegotiation between secular and religious dimensions. In other words, yes, we live in a secular sphere, but the secular sphere in which we live constantly refers back to religious meanings and signification. This does not undermine the secular space in which we live as a secular space. It's just that a pure secular space, clear cut, separated from a religious one, simply uh, does not exist. And so Agamemnon says, well, you know, this kind of domain and this economic theology, the economic theology of government, is something that we should explore more, uh, that we don't really understand. So I thought, wonderful, I know, that's what I'm here for. Uh, so uh, I found this approach really, really useful in order to think about this notion of circularization of the market, particularly in conjunction with, uh, uh, with uh, some of the arguments advanced by Pope Francis on, on the market. And I would like just to give you a brief references on the argument that uh, he makes in Evangelii Gaudium which uh, uh, was published in 2013. And Francis' critique is very interesting because um, I think it's slightly or quite different from the critiques advanced by the previous popes, but I will not say anything more on that because I don't have time. The point, the main point of his critique is that he says there is a fundamental tension between the outcomes of the current economic system and the faith that support the, uh, the current economic systems. In other words, how is it possible that the current economic system is still in place despite the fact that it has, has contributed to create marginalization, exclusion, poverty? It's a system that has locked the marginalized in a condition, he says, without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape. 
And yet still people are reluctant or unable or unwilling to see possibilities without uh, neoliberalism. In other words, how is it possible despite the fact that neoliberalism is a system that has caused an endless series of crises, people continue to believe in trickle-down theories or uh, in the capacity of neoliberalism to bring greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. The answer that Francis provides is that the prevailing economic system has been sacralized. The deified market has become the only rule. So for Francis, this has been made possible by the reduction of man to one of his needs alone, consumption. He says, the unbridled consumerism of today's economic mechanism, he observes, has contributed to turn human beings into consumer goods. Now, what I do in the paper is to try to push this further and argue that what neoliberalism does, or the sacralization of neoliberalism does, more precisely, is not just to turn us into consumer good, but to turn us into valuable forms of capital, and whereby our right to citizenship, or our right to inclusion, our right to protection, our right to have rights, will be a condition of the capital that we are able uh, to express. Hence, the selective openness and closure of border. The fact that if you are a wealthy Muslim, you will be able to purchase multi-citizenship and you will be valued as an important member of society because this is what the Maltese Mi Minister of Interior said. You know, we want these people in Malta, not just because they're rich, but because these are fantastic people. These are people who have connection. They uh, have a wonderful lifestyle that we want to have. They are an example for us. These are more or less his words. Um, um, how much time do I have left? Half a minute. OK, so I'll skip the part where I talk about how these logics are happening also in other countries. Sorry? Right, I'll take another 15 minutes then. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'll skip the case of the UK. I mean, my point here is to say these dynamics are not confined to those states that have, uh, you know, this institutional mechanism. I think the UK is also a very, very interesting illustration. So if you have any questions on that, I'll be happy to answer that. So just to go to the uh, concluding uh, paragraph. Um, so what I would like to do with this paper and possibly uh, future research is try to shed a different light on the uh, civilizational politics of the refugee crisis and more broadly the way we think about uh, civilization and uh, civilized life. Uh, I think that the current crisis is not just the product of civilizational logics or hierarchy and exclusion granted in religion or culture. The, the European refugee crisis and the related proliferation of citizenship by investment schemes in Europe are also the product of a distinctive civilizational political economy grounded in a process of circularization of the market. According to this civilizational logic, refugees and undocumented migrants become excludable if they are considered to be lacking in human or financial capital. Uh, citizens may enjoy less rights than permanent residents if they are considered to be deficient in human or financial capital. This was my UK case. But. And wealthy migrants may enjoy civilizational belonging irrespective of their cultural and religious identity. So these dynamics, I think, call for a deeper understanding of the neoliberal political economy of civilizations and how this may reconfigure the notion of civilization and civilized life beyond traditional markers of cultural and religious identity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mavelli, uh, for this uh, interesting communication on the say, market and secularization. And I'm also very grateful to both of you, actually, who came up with uh, grounds, concrete examples. I mean, that uh, you help us to move from the stratospheric level of the conversation to a very concrete illustration um, of what we discussed, and actually I think it's very important to uh, emphasize that this is not just about uh, theoretical discussion, but that it indeed translates into a concrete uh, uh, expression by the public also and also by um, government behavior. I think this, uh, what you told us about the government of Malta, this is also a very concrete illustration of uh, what's going on. So thanks a lot for bringing us from uh, uh, the stratospheric level to the to the reality. Mm -hmm.